We need to have an approach that approximates the chaotic, complex, often gray nature of the of the world that everyday people live in. And we need to have an approach that cuts across these categories, cuts across these silos. And the reason why is not just because it's a good thing to do, it's it's how we win. That's the voice of Maurice Mitchell, National Director for the Working Families Party. He's today's guest on Press the Button, a Plowshares Fund podcast dedicated to nuclear policy and national security. And now, here are your co-hosts, Michelle Dover and Tom Kalina. Welcome back to Press the Button and happy holidays, Tom. Thanks, Michelle. Happy holidays to you from snowy New Hampshire. We just got about uh, two feet of snow up here and it's lots of fun. And of course, to all of our listeners, we hope you have a safe and relaxing holiday season. But first, let's get to today's episode. Michelle, what do you have lined up for us on early warning? Today, we'll be talking about the implications of the SolarWinds cyber hack and the latest developments about the JCPOA and what next steps the U.S. and Iran might need to take. And after that, Plowshares Fund President Dr. Emma Belcher sits down with Maurice Mitchell, National Director of the Working Families Party, for a discussion about security race and the connections that bind our two fields together. And finally, I answer a question about the National Nuclear Security Administration in this week's Q&A segment. Remember, if you want your question answered on the air, tweet or DM us at PressButtonPod or send us an email at PressTheButton at Plowshares.org. We love hearing from our listeners. And if you like what you hear, please remember to hit subscribe and leave us a rating wherever you get your podcasts. And if we could ask for just one gift this holiday season, it would be that you tell one person about our show, Uh, whether it's a family member, a colleague, or someone in your pandemic pod. Every new listener helps us build our audience and our impact. Thanks so much. And with that, let's get into today's episode. The clock is ticking. And now, early warning. Early warning. Early warning. Early warning. A seven-minute synopsis of this week's nuclear news. Thanks, Dal. Today, I'm joined by Lisa Arias, a member of the WCAP CBRN Working Group and contributing author to WCAP's edited collection, Policy Papers by Women of Color, and Kaylee Thomas, Associate Fellow at the Center for a New American Security and co-founder of CNAS's Make Room Initiative. Thank you so much for joining. Glad to be here. Yeah, same here. So as you know, we have seven minutes to cover the week's nuclear news, and it is quite a set of news starting now. Lisa, last week, the U.S. Department of Energy and the National Nuclear Security Administration confirmed that hackers behind the recent solar winds attack also gained access to NNSA's business networks. Now, To be clear, so far there is no evidence that the malware made it into the more sensitive national security networks. But that said, this news only adds to the concerns about the SolarWinds hack. But let's back up. Can you tell us briefly what this attack was and why it's so concerning? Hi, Michelle. Thanks for having me on. To answer your question, we became aware of the SolarWinds hack earlier this month when the cybersecurity company FireEye broke the news that it had been attacked. Now, the attack is believed to have been carried out by a Russian hacker group known as Cozy Bear with known ties to Russian intelligence, though, of course, Russia has denied this. Um, It has been ongoing since March of this year. The breach occurred through an update in SolarWinds network monitoring software called Orion. And what the hackers did was insert malicious code into the update. And then when users installed that update into the systems, the hackers were provided with a backdoor to access a user's networks. And we know that the update was installed in about 18,000 of SolarWinds customers, which gives a glimpse into the extent of the attack and how many entities were impacted. So as you mentioned, NSA was hacked as well as private companies like Microsoft. 
And one of the reasons that this is so concerning is that it's what's known as a supply chain hack. And what this means is that the attack exploits existing vulnerabilities in the supply chain before a product even gets to the user, which is part of the difficulty. Um, and in the case of the SolarWinds hack, what that meant was embedding malware into software updates for SolarWinds Orion platform. And it's really difficult to detect this type of attack because users are accessing something like an update from a known and trusted entity. And so they have no reason to be suspicious of the software. Um, and in fact, installing this type of update is actually seen as a way to increase security, which makes this an even more cunning breach. Um, and it's also concerning because we don't know the extent nor the specific intent of the hack. So it will be exceedingly difficult because of the stealth nature of the approach to completely remove the malware from the systems. And long story short, it's going to be an ongoing effort and one that we will be engaged in for a while. So when we think about how these types of cybersecurity risks um, impact our nuclear weapons complex, you know, what are the cybersecurity risks that policymakers should be concerned about when it comes to our weapon systems? I want to stress, as you noted earlier, that it was the business networks of NNSA that were targeted. And so as far as we know, there's nothing that indicates sensitive national security networks are compromised. However, it is important to note that just because we caught this attack, it doesn't mean the broader issue is resolved. Um, and I think it's important to highlight that because of the interconnected nature of the federal government, possibilities for what is known as lateral movement. Um, in other words, the ability for this malware to gain access to systems connected to the initial point of access are great. And so in terms of our nuclear weapons systems, the solution to ensuring security might lie in making sure that we disentangle and isolate systems and making sure that our NC3 networks remain air-gapped so that the possibility for this kind of access is minimal if at all existent. Um, but more broadly, we also need to consider the bigger strategic implications of this hack. Um, and to me, this is another instance of us being shocked, but not necessarily surprised. And so it's frustrating to once again, be reacting rather than preemptively preparing for risks that we already knew existed. Um, back in 2018, the GAO actually warned that federal agencies were not taking the steps necessary to secure their systems. And we were also warned of the design flaws inherent in the Einstein system, which is the government's detection system for these types of breaches. And so I think that while it's important to not run away with hyperbole and overreaction, we can't necessarily breathe a sigh of relief simply because mission critical systems weren't affected this time. There is always a next time when it comes to these types of attacks. And so one of the things that we should be doing is preemptively preparing to secure our nuclear infrastructure and to ensure that we're paying attention when we receive warnings from agencies that say, hey, you're not doing as good a job at this as you could be. And so I think that need for greater communication and responsiveness is one of the lessons that we should take from this attack. Thanks, Lisa. Kaylee, switching gears, last week, the IAEA director, Rafael Grossi, said in a Reuters interview that in order for the U.S. and Iran to come back into full compliance with the Iran deal, there would need to be a protocol or an agreement um, that or an understanding that would clearly stipulate what they need to do. And this comment prompted some headlines about whether Grossi said a new agreement would be needed or not. So what was he referring to? The first thing that we need to kind of, you know, get out of the way here is that Grossi was not referring to any kind of sort of agreement that would replace the JCPOA. He was talking about kind of an additional um, corollary ancillary document that would outline, I think, quite clearly the activities and steps Iran needed to take in order to return to compliance. You know, ever since the U.S. withdrew from the JCPOA in 2018, Iran has, over the course of the last couple of years, taken steps um, that have breached or violated the strict constraints that um, the JCPOA placed on its nuclear program, such as stockpiling and rich material beyond its, the limit um, and, you know, in, um, installing and running some centrifuges at, you know, facilities that previously the JCPOA prohibited it from doing so. So what Grossi, I think, is looking for, especially within the context of his role and the IAEA's role, is what is the plan or the path for Iran to return to compliance and how can the IAEA, you know, it, due to its responsibilities, monitor and verify that Iran is undertaking those activities it needs to do in order to return to compliance with the original deal. 
Got it. So what do we know about President-elect Biden's intentions regarding the JCPOA? President-elect Biden has been quite clear and has said repeatedly publicly in a CNN essay and with um, an interview with Thomas Friedman in the New York Times that if Iran returns to strict compliance with the nuclear deal with the JCPOA, the United States would rejoin the agreement and then use that, the the existing deal, as a starting point for follow-on negotiations to address a lot of the kind of complaints against the deal in the United States that led to the U.S. withdrawal in the first place. But as you know, the director of the IEA grossly alluded to, this is a little bit more complicated than it seems because you know Iran is not currently in compliance, and Iran is likely going to be reluctant to take steps to return to compliance without some movement from the United States as well. So Iran's likely looking for a little bit more of a step-by-step re-entry to the JCPOA. So they make a movement to return to compliance. The United States lifts some sanctions where Biden has kind of said that it's look the United States is looking for Iran to fully return to compliance before it lifts any significant sanctions as outlined by the JCPOA. Undergirding all of this, there's even further complications with how domestic politics work with the United States. So reaching any sort of ancillary deal, as Grossi alluded to, outlining this path forward um, would technically, under the Iran Nuclear Agreement Review Act, require congressional approval. That would make Biden have to face a domestic political battle he's probably not looking forward to facing that would draw out this process, make it even longer, um, which is concerning given that we're looking at, you know, uh, Iranian presidential elections in just in June of 2021. Well, with that, our time is up. Lisa, Kaylee, thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Here at Plowshares, we're always looking to influence the development of sound nuclear policy. But we're also looking to think big about the future we want, one that's free of nuclear threat and where we all feel safe. We're seeking truly transformational change. To do this, we're looking to harness powerful ideas by partnering with people in other areas with a range of backgrounds and experiences. And this really means looking beyond the traditional nuclear policy community. That's precisely what we're doing today on Press a Button. I'm thrilled to be joined by Maurice Mitchell, a renowned social movement strategist, leader in the movement for Black Lives, and a community organiser who is the current national director for the Working Families Party. Last month, Maurice joined Plowshares Fund for our annual policy forum, which coincidentally you can find available at plowshares.org. And in this forum, we had a really fascinating conversation about how nuclear weapons fit into our national spending priorities and what we could be doing with that money instead. It was such a great discussion. We just had to bring Maurice back for more. So welcome back, Maurice. It's good to be here. Terrific. Thank you very much. Let's get right to it then. At our forum last month, I asked you what you would do with $260 billion in wasteful nuclear weapons spending. You did something really interesting, which was not directly answer my question first. You took a step back and you spoke about what spending that amount of money, $260 billion, wastefully and on nuclear weapons, what does that say about us and our priorities? So for those who didn't attend the conference, can you repeat what you said about that? Well, taking those steps back, thinking about our priorities, um, you know, I just think about the global economic system that we've chosen to be governed under, neoliberal capitalism, right? And how it prioritizes our ability to um, create, create wealth, to concentrate wealth. Um, it prioritizes our ability to economize things, to count things and to uh, assign, uh, you know, some sort of uh, uh, cash value to those things. It, it, it prioritizes and almost creates a fundamentalist religion around the market. And this idea that the market somehow is this uniquely rational instrument to be able to organize our societies. Um, I think one of the reasons why we continue to, to to be dealing with these existential quest, uh, questions about survival as a as a planet is that we all have agreed to be governed by neoliberal capitalism, and um, it skews our priorities fundamentally. 
And it isn't simply an economic system. It's a, it's a system of logic. And it creates these pockets of immense wealth and, uh, and privilege. So there is a war economy that is self-perpetuating, whether or not it actually adds value to anybody's life. It is self-perpetuating. And according to the, the logic of neoliberalism, uh, an industry doesn't simply need to be profitable. It always needs to be growing. Industries have to grow in order to be intrinsically valuable based on market ideology. Therefore, the war machine doesn't simply need to be big and profitable. It needs to find new markets. It needs to find new ways to grow. We need to further perfect our ability to annihilate each other. Um, and you know, if you take a few steps back, does that actually make any sense at all? At some point, this need for unlimited growth will come up against the realities of all of us living in a planet of finite resources. That's in some way what the challenge that you focused on, the challenge of the war machine and nuclear pro proliferation is about. That's essentially what our fight um, to all of us collectively to challenge climate calamities about. That is essentially what those of us on the movement for black lives are fighting about. When we talk about defund the police, we're talking about investments. And we're having this conversation about what does it mean to have a profit machine around prisons and jails and police? And there's always more money for bigger and better prisons and jails and always more money for police, uh, police forces and, we're, and less and less money to invest in the commons and invest in, in true security. And this question about security, which I think oftentimes um, the language of security um, often is um, code for, for the war machine, right? But when I think about security, I think about my son. I think about community. I think about access to clean air. I think about access to healthcare. And so how are we reframing what security is? And ultimately, all of us were in these bodies that are atrophying, <laughs> you know, over decades. And, you know, what we're seeking to do as a community, as a society, as a civilization is to figure out in this very limited time that we have on this planet, how can we uh, derive pleasure and connection and meaning uh, collectively and individually? And, and fundamental to that is this idea of security because you can't enjoy your life, enjoy community if you don't feel a sense of safety. Right. And so I think it's incumbent on us if we're going to have this conversation that we start from the fundamental question of what is our value set? What are we valuing and what is the purpose of our civilization? What is the purpose of community? What is the purpose of an economy? Right. Um, is it simply to accumulate wealth, to concentrate privilege and power, uh, to uh, be obsessed with growth? Or is it over this relatively short period of time that we have on this planet to derive some level of value, pleasure, connection, and meaning? Um, I would argue it's the latter. And you know, in the final analysis, when most people are on their deathbed, they're not thinking about all the things that they accumulated and you know, the people that they conquered. They're thinking about the, the people that they love about the connections or misconnections, about their ability to make meaning. And so if we focus on those things, uh, that will bring us to radically different conclusions when it comes to how we understand security, when it comes to how we understand investment. And I, I would argue, if we focus on those things, we would demand collectively a new paradigm, a new paradigm for on which, how we wanna govern ourselves, uh, a, new, a new logic set, uh, a new um, set of prerogatives about what we want to do as a civilization, as a human civilization, um, in this particular period of time. You, I think, have put your finger on something really important, and that's about security, what keeps us safe, and how that aligns with our values. And 
listening to you give examples of the different movements, nuclear, racial justice, climate change, are we all doing ourselves a disservice by operating in our silos and each working towards our particular goals and movement? And are we missing an opportunity to kind of come together and say we stand for values of peace and justice and how can we work together to progress this in a more effective way? Yes, I would argue yes. And I understand why we put our issues in silos, why we operate um, in these sort of discrete ways. You know, human beings, we operate in a very complex terrain and we often use these shortcuts or these heuristics in order to make sense of a very complex, scary reality. That's kind of what we've done since we've been human, but there's limitations to it, right? The actual world that we live in is nuanced, is complex, is intersectional. Um, so I have multiple identities, right? And um, I inhabit this male identity. I inhabit this black racialized identity. I inhabit this uh, American national identity. I inhabit an identity based on my parents' immigrant sort of journey. Um, I inhabit a class identity. And I don't put one on and take one off. I experience all these things. And so it's, it's actually really important for our movements to challenge the safety and simplicity of the categorizing of things and sit in the discomfort of the gray area of the messiness that is the nature the actual nature of our universe. The actual nature that we sort of swim in all the time is messy, is gray, it's complex. It's, you know, um, you know for example, race. Race is not a biological fact. However, race is real. Race is a real social, social construct. And, you know, people debate this all the time and they say like, oh, race isn't real. Well, cash money is a social construct. It's not a biological, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a fundamental inherent, inherently valuable thing. However, if I were to burn all of your cash money, you would be upset. So cash money is real. <laughs> it's a real social construct that we've decided that we agree upon that we're going to use this thing. It's the same thing with race, same thing with gender, right? And so um, saying all that to say, we need to have an approach that approximates the chaotic, complex, often gray nature of the, of the world that everyday people live in. And we need to have an approach that cuts across these categories, cuts across these silos. And the reason why is not just because it's a good thing to do, it's, it's how we win, right? As an organizer, I focus on power. Who has it, uh, what they're doing with it, how we collectively could have more of it. And in places like the United States, where we're very ethnically and racially diverse, we need to form governing majorities to do really, really big things. And um, a huge barrier to that in the United States, as well as Europe and in Australia. And you know, you're in Australia right now. It, you know, one of the um, commonalities between the United States and Australia is that the United States and Australia are both settler colonial projects that inhabit an entire continent, right? Um, and in places like this, um, race and ethnicity are fundamental drivers of what we do and how we see one another and what we can't do. And so if we don't make racial justice, challenging white supremacy, challenging white racial grievance and anti-Black racism, a fundamental cause, then there's no way we could create governing majorities to overcome the war machine or to develop a strategy to dramatically transform a, a carbon-based economy into a regenerative economy in the ex expanse of just a decade. There's no way we could do that unless we bring everybody together and people could see, uh, see value in one another. What white supremacy does is it shuts, it does two things. It, it informs white people who's the in-group, who's actually human and who's not. And, you know, human beings have, have this, um, 
this fundamental capacity for immense, uh, immense um, generosity, as well as immense unspeakable um, uh, violence. We have this sort of like dialectical capacity for both of those things. That that uh, capacity for immense violence is unlocked through white supremacy, ethno-nationalism. We've seen it again and again and again throughout history. That capacity for immense generosity is unlocked through the expansion of the commons, the expansion of your who you see as your community, right? And so doing multiracial organizing um, allows people to see each other and to fight for each other and to fight for people's, for each other's common value. Maurice, this is reminding me of that conversation that you and I had after the tape stopped rolling when we recorded our bit for the policy forum. And I mentioned to you some of the discussions currently going on now within the nuclear policy community about structural racism and how it relates to nuclear policy. And it's been interesting because I think there's been some interesting debate and I was telling you a little bit about some of the discussions we've been having in the nuclear policy community about structural racism and nuclear weapons. And it's brought about some interesting debate, but also some tension and some pushback. And you made a really interesting observation about discussing issues of race and other movements. And I think our audience would sort of just love to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I've been part of these debates for, for decades, right? And this is the argument that I hear, right? Like, look, absolutely, I care about racism. I care about uh, sexism. I, I, you know, like I personally um, think it's horrible that people get discriminated against. However, we have limited time. We have limited capacity. So let's prioritize the big issue that everybody deals with. And that might mean we have to deprioritize these other like really important issues, but they're, they're like niche issues that affect certain communities. The one issue that everybody has to deal with is fill in the blanks, is climate change, is nuclear proliferation. It, like That is the one big existential issue we all need to deal with. And we might need to focus on that and not have conversations about these, frankly, divisive issues so that we can have a bigger we to fight for this big issue that if we win, everybody benefits across race, right? So that's the argument. Here is the fundamental problem or contradiction with that argument, right? If you care deeply about nuclear proliferation and winning, on that, or you care deeply about winning on climate. You know, I'll focus on climate because I spend a lot of time in that space. I was a climate refugee. Um, we're organizing with a lot of people to advance the Green New Deal in the US, the Working Families Party. If you seriously want to build the conditions where we could successfully overcome the immense power and privilege of the fossil fuel industry, and of the climate deniers and the ability of organized capital by way of the fossil fuel industry to capture in whole or part um, our government and the decision-making apparatus of our government, you're gonna need to build a lot of power. Now, how do you build that power? Well, I'm an organizer. I understand that people come together in movements where they are seen, right? And they could see each other. And in a place like the United States, all of those people can't simply be of one race, one identity, one gender. So you're gonna need a multiracial, cross-gender, cross multi-ethnic space. Now, the fundamental barrier to creating that space of really excited, really impassioned people that will fight for a North Star is racism, is white supremacy. If you get a bunch of people across difference in a room, you will see all of the race, class, and gender dynamics that make it really hard for people to come together. If you don't prioritize fighting those things in your spaces, 
as well as finding those things in society, then your big, juicy, existential fight for humanity is dead on arrival. And that is why in order to fight the war machine, in order to fight nuclear proliferation, you must fight white supremacy. In order to fight for climate, uh, for climate justice, and in order to create the significant popular will and to marshal the capacities of all of the governments to essentially convert our world economy into a different type of economy, you have to fight xenophobia, white supremacy, racism, um, ethno-nationalism, because we need to ultimately see the humanity in others to join forces with one another. And if you don't do that, your organizing pro uh, uh, project is never going to get off the ground and have enough capacity to win. So speaking about this organizing project capacity win, tell us about the Working Families Party. You know, what's its strategy? What has been its impact? And how did you get drawn to this line of work? Sure, sure. So the Working Families Party is a national political movement that basically is acknowledging the fact that working people deserve their own political party and that we have a very rigid, very, very rigid two-party system uh, in the United States that makes it kind of hard for working people to have their own political real estate. And what we do, we wake up every day and try to create the conditions where working people could develop independent political power and where we could aggregate enough uh, energy and enough grassroots power across race to build a multiracial alignment of forces that are willing to, to engage in a working people's agenda on the very local level, on the state level, and on the federal level. So we endorse like a thousand candidates across the country and we're very successful at primarying, you know, what we call, you know, centrist or establishment politicians for working people politicians that are, are willing to have this conversation about why, um, why uh, neoliberal capitalism as a system of logic and, and a system of, as a system of logic and, a, and an economic system fundamentally is in cross purposes with humanity, <laughs> right? And fundamentally in cross purposes with democracy, right? So, you know, there has been this neoliberal sort of consensus that both Democrats and Republicans have hewn to for, for decades. And that has limited us having this robust conversation. And we are trying to create an intervention where we could have the conversation, where we could demonstrate that people-centered uh, politics and values are actually popular and are the way of the future. And that we actually, it's, it's actually uh, sensible for us to get ahead of that wave and build movements that could do that. That's what the Working Families Party is all about. Um, and uh, I got involved, I'm an organizer. I got involved on the very local level, wanting to make a, a difference locally. And what I discovered is that when you bring together a few dozen people to work on a small problem, sometimes you win on that small problem, but you always come up against a structural barrier. And you have a choice, you can either continue to bang your head up against that structural barrier, or you could uh, reason that you have to aggregate more power to ultimately break that barrier down completely or, or, or partially. And so as a local organizer, I kept on coming up against these barriers that were structural. And I realized that it's not just about winning on this issue locally or an issue here discreetly. There, there were structures in place that I could either hit my head up against the wall and experience the same defeat or build a broader sort of movement that could actually challenge the, the structures and, and create a sea change in our politics. And that's what brought me to going from local organizer to statewide organizer to movement organizer in the movement for black lives uh, with the murder of Michael Brown, where I was one of a number of people who um, embedded deeply with organizations like the Organization for Black Struggle in St. Louis to help uh, build the movement for black lives in 2014 and catalyze it into an international movement to facing Donald Trump's victory 
and witnessing him ride a white Christian identity wave to the White House and then deciding fundamentally that my next order of business was figuring out how to build a multiracial alignment of forces that were that were as animated by solidarity as white Christian identity uh, movements were animated by hate and, and white supremacy. And that would be my next, uh, my next mission. And that's what brought me to the Working Families Party, where I'm leading a national movement that, that seeks to do exactly that. And I would, you know, for those, those folks that are listening that are in the States, it, you know, if you don't mind, I'd like to share how people could learn to, how to get more involved. Um, Please do. So folks in the States could text WFP to 30403, and then we could be in relationship. Uh, for those of you that are li listening internationally, you could check out uh, our, our website at workingfamilies.org or peoplescharter.us, which lays out our sort of visionary plan of how we, how we develop a roadmap from the crisis that we're in, all of us, uh, to how we develop a roadmap from the crisis that we're in, all of us, um, to, um, to an economy, uh, both a global economy and a U.S. economy that is based on care and solidarity. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, Maurice, this has been a fascinating conversation. Really enjoyed it. And, you know, I really am looking forward to hopefully future collaboration and sitting in discomfort of the gray area with uh, you and others like you as we really try to make sense of this world and what uh, is truly important to us, what truly keeps us safe and how to make sure we have a safe and just and prosperous world for all. So thanks so much for your time. Thank you, it was great to be here. My name is Elizabeth Warner and I'm the Managing Director of Plowshares Fund. Even though I've been working in the nuclear field for nearly nine years, there is still so much to learn that's why I'm a dedicated listener of Press the Button. Once a week in less than an hour, I can get the top stories of the week and a deeper dive into critical conversations with thought leaders and experts in nuclear policy and national security. I'm also a proud supporter of Plowshares Fund. Did you know that many of the guests featured on Press the Button are supported by Plowshares Fund? And Plowshares in turn is supported by individuals just like you, curious, committed, passionate, so if you like what you're hearing on Press the Button and want to support the work of Plowshares Fund, please donate today. Whether it's $5, 50 or 500 your generosity helps create a safer future, free from the threat of nuclear weapons. Visit plowshares.org today to make a year-end donation. Or join me and make it monthly. Whatever you do, stay informed, stay safe, and stay connected. Together, we can create a world where nuclear weapons can never be used again. Thank you for listening. And now everyone's favorite nuclear Q&A segment, I'm Zach Brown, producer with the podcast, and I get to ask this week's question, which comes from Richard in Massachusetts. Are you ready for this, Michelle? I sure am. Great. Well, Richard from Massachusetts asks, we heard about the Russian hack that got into the National Nuclear Security Administration, among other places. But what does the NNSA do? Should we be concerned about our nuclear arsenal? Thanks, Richard. That is a great question. Um, and I know we touched on this a little bit in our early warning segment, but I th I'm so glad we get to go in a little deeper. So first of all, the National Nuclear Security Administration, also known as the NNSA, is a what's called a semi-autonomous agency within the Department of Energy. And it is responsible for the safety, security, and reliability of the U.S. nuclear arsenal full stop. Uh, essentially, they are in charge of the weapons. Um, they actually lend them to the Department of Defense for deployment. But when you think of who's in charge of modernization, who's in charge of ensuring that they are effective, that is the NNSA. Additionally, the NNSA is also responsible for many of the nonproliferation elements, uh, projects within the U.S. government for providing uh, nuclear 
propulsion technology for the Navy. Um, and they also respond to nuclear and radiological emergencies, both in the US and abroad. Um, you know, and what they do in terms of how they operate, you know, they're very technically focused. They oversee the national lab complex. Um, these include the laboratories like Sandia National Laboratory, Los Alamos, Livermore. But more specifically, they have uh, what are called NNSA facilities at Pantex Y-12, the Kansas City plant. Um, and they're also responsible for the transportation um, of materials between these sites. So to your second question then, should we be concerned about our nuclear arsenal? Um, I'm, I'm going to assume that you mean from the cybersecurity perspective about this hack. Yes, we should be concerned, though maybe not how you might think initially. It, the SolarWinds attack hit the business systems of NNSA networks. These are not the classified systems. Um, so as far as we know, it really was only focused on these unclassified systems. Um, but we should be looking at the extent of the hack. This is still the early days. Um, we should be looking at whether and if so, how any information was exfiltrated and why it took so long to catch. Um, you know, there's also some risk from what's called the mosaic effect. If, you know, depending on what types of data you can collect from unclassified systems when put together, does that create a, um, you know, a, a more clear picture of something that's more sensitive. Uh, but, you know, in terms of did they uh, hack our command and control systems at this point, there is no evidence to suggest that was the case. Um, but I think more broadly, from a cybersecurity standpoint, when it comes to our nuclear arsenal, yes, we should be concerned. Um, the uh, Nuclear Threat Initiative actually just released a very timely report last week um, called U.S. Nuclear Modernization, Security and Policy Implications of Integrating Digital Technology, which provides recommendations for how digital security and reliability should be prioritized as aging facilities and technologies are upgraded or replaced and how the U.S. government also needs to consider the implications of digitization for U.S. nuclear policy and posture. Um, you know, the fact that we are asking these questions of, you know, did they make it into our systems, into the more sensitive systems? What would that mean um, for the systems? And do we retain control over them is another element of any cyber security um, risk when it comes to our our systems? Um, you know, the NNSA is responsible for the reliability of our systems and, and introducing any sort of unreliability, whether real or imagined, um, has this effect of, of weakening uh, the security of the arsenal. Another week, another question. Thanks, Michelle. And thank you, Richard. And remember, if you would like to get your question on the air, tweet or DM us at PressButtonPod or send us an email at Press the button at plowshares.org. Thanks for listening to Press the Button. This podcast is produced by Delphine Vigil, Zach Brown, Derek Sender, and Will Lowry. Sound design by Derek Sender. Audio engineering by Derek Sender and Will Lowry. Our theme song is by Lyrics Born and the Poets of Rhythm, sampled with kind permission. Additional music by San Francisco-based bands 17 Evergreen and the Society of Rockets. To continue the dialogue and support our work, visit plowshares.org.